We're going to split our time between New York and Johannesburg. Oh. Yeah. But I'll be going into Lagos for a lot of... I'll probably be spending about two months a year in Lagos, but I won't, I won't live. It up. Great. Hey, Madeline. What are you wearing? Hi. Good afternoon, and welcome to our second public event. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have with us here today uh, David Rubenstein. David uh, flew out this morning, had to do a, something in Washington, flew out from Washington this morning and is flying back. The only reason I mention that is because David is not only a very generous person, but he's generous with his time and energy. He gets deeply involved in every uh, board, every group that he um, uh, donates to or has been with, uh, whether it's Duke University, Harvard, the Council on Foreign Relations, Brookings, the Aspen Institute. Some of you are, are vamping for a moment, so everybody will take their seats, please. Uh, uh, some of you know and some of you are here from our new China Leadership Institute, the latest in the Aspen Global Leadership Network. That was made possible by a very generous donation from David. David is also uh, sponsoring this convening, along with Linda Resnick and Stuart Resnick and others. So I'd like a big round of applause, please, for David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David, you've been a successful entrepreneur. At a certain point, you really threw yourself into philanthropy. Why and what, what was your motivation there? Well, I uh, came from very modest circumstances. Uh, neither of my parents graduated from uh, college or high school. I was the only child. And uh, to get to college, I needed a scholarship. And to get to law school, I needed a scholarship. <laughs> and in those days, um, you know, you didn't think a lot about giving away money. You thought about making money. So, um, you know, I, I uh, didn't really have a gigantic philanthropic bent, to be honest. Though I, as a young boy, I heard John Kennedy's clarion call saying, ask not what your country can do for you. And so I wanted to go into government. I wanted to serve my country. And I didn't think I had the charm, the good looks, the appeal of John Kennedy. Um, and there were, that was, I think, a fairly unanimous view um, by people. So I thought I would be an advisor to a president and work in the White House and do my service to the country that way. And the making of money was completely um, not on my horizon. I just never had any, never thought about it. It wasn't, wasn't uh, particularly appealing. So I went to work for Ted Sorensen, who was the brilliant speechwriter and counsel to John Kennedy, thinking that maybe some of his luster would work off on, or rub off on me. And ultimately, I did get a job in the White House. And as some of you may know, I worked for President Carter and managed to get inflation to 19%, a very difficult thing to do. <laughs> Mortgage rates to 22%, also hard to do. Um, so the chance of being the senior domestic advisor in the second term didn't materialize since we, <laughs> the, the country didn't seem to like that level of inflation. Um, so I went back and practiced law. And uh, again, I, I wouldn't say I loved it. You know, I, I, I was adequate at it. Um, it to, to really do something great in this world, you have to love it with a passion. And I didn't love it. And my clients told me they didn't think I was that great. Um, <laughs> Every time I said I might do something else, they said, well, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> so same with my partner. So you get a hint after a while. Um, and so I, you know, not knowing anything about finance, um, I recruited three people who had some business experience. And in 1987, I started a firm that became one of the largest private equity firms in the world. And uh, you know, my goal was to make money, because that's how you measured success. And I figured I you know, would do well. But all of a sudden, I read uh, on that a, I was 54 years old. Uh, I was twice as old as I had been when I went to work in the White House. I was 27 at the White House, 50, 27 years later, I'm 54. I read that on average, a white Jewish male who gets to 54 will on average, don't anybody get concerned about this, but you might live to about 82 or 83 on average. 
um, on average. There's always exceptions, and my father exceeded it as well. So, so I figured, uh-oh, I'm not great in arithmetic, but I figured I've already lived two-thirds of my expected life. <laughs> so I thought I got a third to go. So I said, okay, I've now made a lot of money, um, more than I could expend in my lifetime. Um, when you're buried with your, you know, you don't really need a lot of money. Um, the ancient <laughs> Egyptian pharaohs, you know, they were buried with their wealth, but it's no evidence that it really helped them that much. <laughs> so I said, okay, I could leave it all to my children, but I've never noticed anybody won a Nobel Prize inheriting $500 million or something. So people who do great things in the world probably don't inherit $500 million or some gigantic sum. And I didn't think my children needed that much money. They didn't completely agree, but they come around <laughs> to that view. And so I decided I could have my executor give away the money, and if I was watching from either above or below, I could maybe get some pleasure out of it, but I thought it'd be greater pleasure to do it while I'm alive. So I decided to uh, give away the money, uh, basically all of it, and um, Bill Gates then called me around that time, and, and um, he said, uh, would you like to uh, sign the giving pledge? And I said, okay, I'm gonna do more than that anyway. The giving pledge is nice, and some of you have read about it. It says you're gonna give away half your money in your lifetime or upon your death. And of course, if you haven't given away any money in your lifetime, but upon your death you think you're gonna give it away, but then you don't, they don't exhume you or something, there's nothing to happen. So there's no, there's no real guarantee that you're gonna honor the giving pledge. And um, there are some suggestions that a few people have signed it maybe so they can hang out with Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, but they haven't actually given away any money. And uh, who knows, maybe they will, and who knows, we can't exhume them if they don't. But, um, so I decided to get involved in it, and I, I took, um, the word philanthropy is an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. It has nothing to do with billionaires writing checks. It has to do with helping other people, and that's what the ancient Greeks meant by it. And therefore, I tell people all the time that the problem with the giving pledge, while it's very good and it's designed to motivate many people to give away more money, on the theory that if you give away money, probably some of it will be useful and do some good things, um, that's the theory at least, I think it generally works, but not always, um, that you should, um, uh, in, in, in giving away money, you should recognize that you can be more helpful in some cases by giving your time and your energy and your ideas. Um, I think that Wendy Kopp, for example, who started Teach for America, is a great philanthropist. She had, she had an idea, she pursued it, she changed American education a bit, um, and I think it was a terrific idea. Now, when you list the greatest philanthropist in the United States, unfortunately, she's not listed because we list people by how much money they've given away as opposed to how many great ideas they've had or how they've changed the country. So my, it's unfortunate that philanthropy has become synonymous with just writing checks, and it shouldn't be. It should be giving your time, your energy, and ideas. And so I, I do give away money, and I hope to give away you know, virtually all that I have, but I, I want to make sure I'm involved as well in these institutions, and I came to it late in life, and I now tell students when I talk to them all the time, don't make the mistake that I did. Don't wait till you're 54 to start giving away your money or getting involved in philanthropy. Do it younger because you will be a better, better person for it. And, and, and it's a, there's a selfish reason as well. Um, when you're involved in philanthropy, you feel much better about yourself. Nobody who gives away money says, oh, I hate myself for having done this. Nobody does that. <laughs> Nobody who helps somebody else in a volunteer effort says, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Nobody feels that way. They always feel better. Well, when you feel better about yourself, you might actually live longer. And um, I think there's some reason to think that's true. And therefore, you know, I tell young people, get involved in the beginning, and, and you'll live longer, you'll feel better about yourself, and I think you'll realize that whatever you might do in your profession that's not philanthropically oriented, you will be more successful in that regard and people will think better things of you and that will be, uh, that will be good. One last point. And it's interesting, when I built my company um, with the help of a lot of people and it, we were lucky and we made a lot of mistakes, but it became a very large company and got to be reasonably well known in the financial service world. Um, my mother, uh, who wanted me to be a dentist, she thought the highest calling of mankind was to be a dentist. <laughs> you get to be called a doctor. Uh, you don't have to go to medical school, but you can still be a doctor. Um, you know, have office hours that are regular, um, no weekend hours, and she spent a lot of time in dentist chairs. I think that's why she liked it. Anyway, I, I also tell young people, uh, respect your parents, call them all the time, but don't do what your mother wants you to do because you're gonna be more successful in life if you do what you wanna do and not what your mother or your father wants you to do. But it's interesting, all the time that I was building Carla, my mother was happy and she was never upset and so forth, but the only time when I started giving away large sums of money, she actually called me and said, I'm proud that you're doing that. She never said I was, she was proud that I built Carlisle, and maybe she was, but she didn't say that to me. She was proud that I'd given away money, I'm doing this, helping people, she would say, and that's much more important to her than, um, than the other stuff, so maybe the mother test is the most important one in the end. If you can please your mother, that's the hardest thing, particularly if you're Jewish. <laughs> How did you 
get into patriotic philanthropy? Um, it's uh, an interesting phenomenon uh, in the sense that most philanthropy, most of my philanthropy, to be honest, um, is I'm giving money to education, uh, universities, at a uh, K-12 education or medical research. But lots of people do that, and they make better sums and bigger sums than me, and they're more engaged. But because I took one little area and no one else was doing much in it, it got more attention. And I more or less coined this phrase, patriotic philanthropy, though I guess all philanthropy is patriotic in a sense you're helping your country. But uh, what I meant by that was doing things to help your country when your country doesn't have the money to do it. And so I, um, I started really in a, in a fluke way. Um, I, I didn't have the intention to do it. If I had hired McKinsey and said, can you figure out how, how I can help my country more, and maybe a year they'd come back with a study and they'd have a whole bunch of things and it would sound good, but I really you think the best things in life are done spontaneously. And so this was a very spontaneous beginning. What happened was um, I was invited to go to a viewing of uh, the Magna Carta, the most famous document some people would say in history, at least in Western history. I went to this viewing and I looked at it and was told by the, uh, the curator at Sotheby's, I'm not an art collector so I'd never been to Sotheby's before and I just was invited by an investment banker to go to it. And they, the curator said it's going to be auctioned off tomorrow night. It'll be uh, probably sold to somebody outside the country. It's owned by Ross Perot. There are 17 copies of the Magna Carta in the world. Um, there were various versions, 1215, 1224, 1225, and 1297, which actually became the law of England. The 1215 one that you all heard about actually never became the law of England. It was abrogated two weeks after uh, King John uh, put his uh, 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 seal on it. So it never, it's historic, but it really didn't have uh, that big an impact. The 1297 one did. And the impact is that it affected British law and ultimately was the inspiration for the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution. So while it wasn't signed in this country, it, it did influence the Founding Fathers, as they said, when they drafted it. And one of the reasons we broke away from England was because the Founding Fathers thought, and others in the country, that uh, we had the rights of Englishmen, and the rights included the rights of the Magna Carta, and they weren't being granted by King George. So that led to the, the revolution. So um, when the, the curator said to me, it's going to be bought by somebody taken out of the country, um, I was a little surprised. I said, well, who owns it? Ross Perot. He got in a fight with uh, uh, the National Archives. He had bought it in 1981 or two uh, from a British family that had it in his possession for 500 years, and he um, uh, bought it, brought it back to the United States, put it on display in the National Archives, and he got in a fight with them or something, and he wanted to put up for, for sale, and the highest price would win. And so I would have, you know, maybe he should have said it should go to state as somebody who will be an American advisor. But anyway, he didn't do that for whatever reason. So I decided that right then and there that I was going to go back the next night and buy it. And I didn't want to tell anybody, because, you know, it sounds presumptuous to say to your wife, well, I'm going to go buy the Magna Carta tomorrow. <laughs> um, and I... I would say I didn't want to tell, uh, you know, my children, because they would say, well, how much less money will this mean for us? So I, I didn't... <laughs> So I didn't do any. I just rearranged my schedule. I got back there the next night, and I got there in time, and, and you know, they put me in a little room. I didn't, you know, I thought you'd go down and you wave or your hand or something, but they didn't. They said, no, go in this little room. Go in a room. They lock the door. They put in a telephone, and maybe some of you have done this. And they start bidding, and you get carried away. Any of you been in an auction, you get carried away, and you bid a little bit more than you thought you were going to bid. So uh, has that ever happened to anybody? So, um, <laughs> so I'm bidding and bidding, and I'm feeling good about it. Then all of a sudden, the guy says, sold. So okay. Then it was me. So the head of Sotheby's, who was the auctioneer, came in and said, uh, you know, who are you? We've we never seen you before. Um, I said, who I was? He says, okay, you can afford this, right? I said, yes, I can. Okay, well, then it's yours, and you can slip out the side door, and nobody will ever know. We don't tell people. But there are 100 reporters there who want to know where it's going to go. So I said, I'll talk to him. I'll tell him why. And I went out and said, look, I wanted to give this as a permanent loan, and upon my death, it will go to the uh, National Archives um, as a small down payment on my obligation to this country, because I came from very modest circumstances, and I rose up to have much more wealth than I really need, and I want to give back to the country that made it possible. Uh, certainly for somebody with a name like Rubenstein might not have risen up in every other country, but this country, I did rise up from very modest circumstances, and I'm very pleased that it had happened, and I want to begin to pay back the country for it, and that's what I, what I did. And what happened was I got in the habit of people calling me and saying, well, you'd like to buy the Magna Carta? I have one, too. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, eventually it turns out all these are fakes, but, but uh, so I have a letter that says, you know, I, I don't want to corner the market in the Magna Carta, so I'm not going to buy yours, but, but I did get in the habit of buying other, other documents, so I bought some rare copies of the Declaration of Independence, rare copies of the Emancipation Proclamation, rare copies of the 13th Amendment, signed by Abraham Lincoln, and I put them not in my home, but in places where people can see them, so the State Department, the National Archives, the National Constitution Center, 
um, and, and the Congress and so forth, where people can see them and, and ultimately they will go to these institutions. I, I don't give them now because I like to make sure they're on display and as, I, as the owner I can still say you have to display them. I did give one of my rare copies of the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln signed the original, original which is in the archives, but he signed some souvenir copies that were auctioned off for $10 or sold for $10 a piece in the 1860s. Only about 11 of them remain. I own two of them. One of them I've given to the White House. It's in the Oval Office and the President's very happy it's there because he's very proud of, of that document. Probably the most important thing any President's ever did by his signature. And one will go to the new African American History and Culture Museum. So I've kind of done that and then recently I, uh, when, when things happen in Washington, I want to help. I try to do things. So like when the Washington Monument um, had an earthquake, I offered to put up the money to repair it, um, and I was prepared to put it all up, but then the Congress said, well, we want some credit too. So they <laughs> I said, fine, do what you want. But they Boy, you could change America right. quite easily so by then, the, the Congress. Well, the, 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 well, the National Park Service originally said the Congress will never get the money appropriated, they'll be fighting and so forth. So I put up the money right away, and then the Congress said, oh, somebody else will get some good publicity for doing something, so we want some. So we, part, we split it. And then recently, I, I, so we're now redoing the Washington Monument. I recently climbed up to the top, and I was Going to the top, uh, it was supposed to be an elevator, they had a scaffolding outside, and I said, okay, I can give scaffolding outside and take the elevator up, but then the Secretary of Interior showed up that morning, and she's a mountain climber, and she said she'd climb Mount Rainier seven times. And I said, well, I've flown over Mount Rainier seven times, but <laughs> she said, you gotta walk up with me. So I said, is there a defibrillator anywhere? So, um, so we walked up, and I'm you know, sweating to the top, and I get there, she's not sweating at all, of course, and I get to the very top, and it's 555 feet. And you have the greatest view in the world of Washington, for sure. And of course, the, some reporter wrote that I was holding on uh, the railing very tight, which I was. But um, you know, I just felt that uh, when you're giving back to your country, it's, it's, it's a different thing. And I want to remind people that the country doesn't have the resources it once did. We don't have the ability to fix things that we, we should, should do. And many of the things that are, are, are financed for previously by the federal government cannot be anymore. So citizens should say, one of the things you can do is give your time, your energy, your ideas, and maybe your money to help the federal government because it's the, really the government that made a lot of it possible for us to be able to afford our lives. So that's how I kind of um, I look at it. And it's helped you sort of uh, grapple with the history around these documents. I know whether it's the Gettysburg right, right. Address, 14th, 13th, 14th Amendment, Emancipation. What, what has interested you the most when you... Uh... Well, I, I, I was a, as a student, I was okay, but I wasn't great in the sciences, so I you know, probably was better in history, so I, can, I, can, I love reading history and like giving speeches about it and talking about it, and uh, I'm just amazed at how little I knew when I started get, digging into these things. When you all went to high school or junior high school, you probably learned about the American Revolution or Civil War, but if you go back now and read about it, you realize how little you actually knew compared to what you would know now as an adult when you're reading it, and so I just find fascinating some of the things I now learn and try to imparted a bit in some talks and so forth. Um, I'd, I'd say that uh, I am disappointed that Americans don't know as much about their country's history as they should. In a recent Pew survey, Pew Institute survey, it turned out that more high school students could name the first three names of the three stooges than the first three names of any founding fathers. Another survey showed that um, when asked what river did George Washington cross during the Revolutionary War, about 30% of Americans said the Rhine River, which happens not to be in the country. <laughs> and when asked who was the first Secretary of Treasury, about 30% of Americans said Larry Summers, which is <laughs> not the case. Um, so I think you know, it's a very good idea for Americans to learn more about your history. Uh, George Santayana, the very famous Ameri uh, American and Harvard historian, said those who don't remember history are condemned to relive it. Um, and repeat the mistakes, and so while that's not completely accurate all the time, I do think that people should know more about American history, and I try to uh, preserve these documents in part to kind of let people know about it, history. Out of left field, since you mentioned Larry Summers, should he be Fed uh, Chair? <laughs> what was your next question? Okay. <laughs> uh, no, Larry, Larry is a person I've known for a long time. He's an extraordinarily talented person. Obviously, um, an incredible uh, fight is now going on in Washington about Larry versus Janet Yellen, and the uh, president made it clear he's not going to decide for a while, so it, it's, it's unclear that what, what I say will have any influence there. All right, before we go back to philanthropy, let me ask you about the American economy and what, what, what right. you see happening and what should be done. Well, the American economy um, is probably in reasonable shape. We're going to grow at about 2.5% this year. Now, after the recession ended, uh, we didn't grow as much as we should have, 
And to really rebound from a recession as deep as one as we, we had, we probably should have grown at 4 to 5 percent. That just didn't happen. And so as a result of this recession, which was much deeper than anybody really thought, uh, we are still coming out of it. Now, all of you, when you went to college, learned that a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative growth. But that is a dated, outdated definition, in my view. It should be uh, when the unemployment rate uh, gets back to where it was before the recession. And we still don't have the unemployment rate back there. And as a result, while we're not technically in a recession, we still haven't completely recovered. However, the United States is in better shape than other developed markets, the developed markets being Japan and Western Europe principally. Uh, they, Europe is in a recession a bit still and will be for another year or so, or at least negative growth uh, for quite a while. And Japan is in a very low growth to no growth situation. So we're in reasonable shape. But the things that make me feel really good about the U.S. economy, despite our uh, big problems, the big problems being the $16 trillion of debt, which we're not likely to solve anytime soon, unless I'm brought back to bring inflation under, you know, <laughs> higher again, and, um, and then we can inflate our way out of it, but there's been no demand for me to come back to do that. Um, so we have that debt, we have in growing income disparity, which is greater than it has ever been in our country, and we also have a high unemployment rate, and we also have a, not a real unemployment rate of 7.5%, it's really about 13.5% because the real marginally attached rate is about 13.5%, and many people who lost their jobs who were in their 50s in the Great Recession are not going back to work, so we've reduced the number of people in the workforce. So we have to solve all those problems. But despite all those problems, we, are, we have some really good things going for us. One, we have the only reserve currency in the world, so people need to have dollars, and there's not going to be another reserve currency for a while. Second, we have an energy revolution going on that is really transforming our economy and keeping energy prices relatively low compared to where it is around the rest of the world and will enable us to be a net exporter at some point of energy. Third, uh, housing prices are coming back and home building is beginning again and that is usually a good sign we're getting out of a, a recession. And fourth, the R&D phenomenon in this country, the, uh, in, in, the innovation and all the kinds of things we do to reinvent ourselves is going forward, I think, at full steam ahead and, and we are the envy of the world in that area. So I think we have some very good signs, but it is un unfortunate, I think, that most of us probably will see our children not have an economy or a optimism as much about their future as we had about our future when we were their age. Because we have to recognize the United States is not going to be as dominant economy as it was when we were growing up. Um, when we were growing up, the United States was almost half the world's GDP. Now we're about 21 or 22 percent and probably heading down. So the emerging markets have emerged. They will be a bigger factor going forward than they have been in our lifetime. And we have to recognize that we'll be an important economic power, but not quite as dominant as we once were. Uh, you mentioned growing income inequality. Is that just a moral issue, or is it also an economic problem that we're facing? Well, obviously, it's a moral issue because it's not fair that certain people are at the bottom and don't seem to be having the ability to get to the top. You know, I started at the bottom, and with, but I didn't have the handicaps that some people have, for sure, disabilities and others had, so there are many people with greater problems than I had. But um, clearly, I thought I had the path to the top, and I thought I could get there. Many people don't have that view right now because they think that the system is so weighted against them. And it's a moral problem because no economy and no country can really live up to the ideals that we have for ourselves, or any country has, if people don't feel at the bottom they can ever rise to the top. And increasingly, a large part of the underclass in our country don't feel they can rise to the top. But as an economic issue, uh, it's very important as well because if you don't have people who don't have wealth feeling that they can rise up and working hard and creating more wealth, ultimately um, the economy isn't going to prosper. And so the greatest problem I think we really have in the country right now is not the debt, which is a big problem, but it's manageable, can be solved over a period of time. And it's not the income disparity because it's great, but that can be eventually dealt with if we do one thing I'm going to mention. And it's not uh, just the unemployment rate. It is that uh, we are not educating our young people as well as we should. We, have the, we are the envy of the world in higher education. Everybody wants a Harvard degree, a Stanford degree, a Duke degree, a Chicago degree, a Penn. Everybody around the world always say to me, can you get my child into these schools? Not that I can, but they always hope that you know, they can help them some way. People want these American degrees. Maybe they even want the education as well, but they certainly want the degree. Um, <laughs> Nobody calls me up and says, can you get my kid into a public school K-12 program in the United States? Nobody ever says that. Why is that? Because the K-12 program is broken, largely. Now, obviously, we've made some progress with charter schools, and we've made enormous progress the last couple of years compared to where it was. But you have a situation in Washington, D.C., where roughly half the people, as an example, who enter the D.C. public high schools do not graduate from high school. And if you do not graduate from high school, your chance of earning money uh, comparable to a college graduate is much reduced. You'll probably earn, on average, less than 50% of what a college graduate earns if you don't graduate from high school, much less than 50%. You have a greater chance of going to prison. 
a much greater chance of going to prison. People that don't graduate from high school um, have a much greater chance of being in our penal system than people who do graduate from high school. And then you have an underclass that really, I think, saps the, the morality and the uh, economic vitality of the country, and that is our greatest single problem. We can only, in, in the end, solve econ in disparity if we are educating people who need to be educated and they graduate from high school and they actually go to college or an equivalent. Getting back to uh, philanthropy, which is a subject here, there's a question that people started asking 10, 15 years ago that in some ways I feel has um, gotten challenging and almost trite at the same time, which is how do you measure success as opposed to sort of what are your goals and why are you pursuing them? Do you ask yourself how do you measure success in philanthropy? There are some people who have a you know, business people, um, when they've made a lot of money in business, they often think, okay, I can take these skills and put them in the philanthropy, and maybe sometimes some of the skills do work. But you have a, a, a measurement in business, which is profit and loss and earnings and so forth, and it's tempting for some business people to say, well, I want an equivalent metric in philanthropy. But no one has ever really come up with a perfect one, and so I don't think it's really as easy to do or maybe as a good idea. In my own case, um, I have a more complicated, maybe, or simple metric. Uh, remember, when the Declaration of Independence was written, Thomas Jefferson wrote a sentence that you and I have talked about and is the most famous sentence in the English language, by far. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, he put the pursuit of happiness over property. Very other, other people had written similar things, and they said property, but he said the pursuit of happiness. And he didn't mean just being giddy. He meant the ability to um, achieve your, one's goals in life. And I, you know, in the end, I think the pursuit of happiness is what everybody in America, everybody in the world should have as a goal. And so when I do something and I am happy, and if you're Jewish, it's very difficult to be happy. Um, <laughs> but when I'm happy, you know, that's my metric. If I feel that I have accomplished something and I'm happy, that's a pretty good metric. Now, every time I'm happy, I might be happy because somebody's deluding me about how much success I have in, the, in a philanthropic thing, and there's some delusion going on. But I, I don't think you can have a perfect measurement. I think whether you can produce happiness in yourself is a very good thing, and I think if donors can feel they're, they're happy and they produce happiness in others, that's a reasonably good goal. And so the pursuit of happiness for oneself and the pursuit of happiness for somebody else is a pretty good metric that I like to use, and it's different than the profit and loss, profit and loss statement, but for, for the time being, it's adequate for me. What Thank you. I agree. What, what philanthropists do you admire? Well, in philanthropy, um, you have to remember that, 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 that wealthy people um, didn't really get along with the idea or accept the idea of giving away their money, uh, really, until um, Andrew Carnegie. He wrote a book called The Gospel of Wealth, in, I think in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. And he said, in the end, that everybody who has lots of money should give it away and die broke. And he didn't quite succeed at that, but he did give away lots of money. And uh, John D. Rockefeller read that book, or somebody read it for him, or something, he was influenced by it. <laughs> and he gave away a lot of money. He had more money than Andrew Carnegie. And that idea of very wealthy people giving away their money uh, became established as part of the American culture, even though we had a history of volunteerism. Our country was built by volunteers helping the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. But we didn't have a lot of wealth for a lot of people to give away money. It really happened in the, in the late 1800s when people had enough wealth in the early part of the 20th century, but had enormous amounts of money, they could give away money and not no, really notice it. And I think that happened, and then when World War I and World War II came along, this, the incentive to give away money and changed a bit. But I think uh, one person who really helped get it back on track is Ted Turner. Um, he challenged very wealthy people uh, about 20 years ago now to quit just hoarding their money and, and, and happy, being happy with their measurement in the, the Forbes 400, but give it away. And he ultimately gave a billion dollars to the United Nations Foundation that he helped create and gave away a lot more money as well. But that was a gift that I think inspired other people. But to me, there is one philanthropist in the country, and really maybe you could say two, um, who are, transcend everybody else, and that's Bill and Melinda Gates. Uh, you cannot possibly measure what they're doing compared to what anybody else has done. The amount of money that they have, and the money that's been given to them by Warren Buffett as well, but their own money. And the difference, though, about just giving away the money it, and, and is what they're doing compared to some other philanthropists I know, and even compared to John D. Rockefeller and others, is they are deeply involved in everything they do. They know it better than the recipients. They know everything. And putting their, that much time into it, and, and you know, when you don't need to do that, because of all the other wealth and things they have and the, all the things they could spend their time doing, is an incredible thing. And 
And I, I applaud Bill and Melinda Gates for doing this. I think they are the best philanthropists in the world, and I think it's a, a, not a tragedy, but it will ultimately have to be rectified that they should win the Nobel Peace Prize for what they've done in times of inspiring other people to get involved in philanthropy, and being so deeply engaged is really a terrific thing, and they're the ones I admire the most. Wow, yeah. Do you have any questions? Um, raise your hand. Yes, right there. Shout it out. I'll repeat it. When you speak about education being so critical, do you misaccept in the long term, a thousand years, that people are educated into the capitalist system? Is there a better system down the line? Feudalism, slavery? The question is whether or not uh, capitalism will be the final way we educate people into, or whether there's a better system down the line. You know, I, that is a more uh, a deeper question than I'm probably going to get into in a two-minute answer, but um, I don't know of any economic system that actually has worked better, but capitalism doesn't have its, uh, is imperfect. I, I, was, I wrote a, a column for the FT recently, they asked me to write a column about capitalism, and I did it under the name of Adam Smith, and I basically said, <laughs> You know, Adam Smith writing from the dead, saying, look, I never told you that capitalism was perfect. I said it had its imperfections. It has some in, 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 um, income disparities. It, it doesn't work perfectly, but I, there's no better system. So if somebody comes up with a better system, I would say, fine, let's adopt it. For the time being, capitalism, with all its warts, is the best system for incenting people to kind of rise up from the bottom and also for spreading wealth around, particularly if philanthropy is incented. Uh, but, you know, there may be a better system someday, but I've looked at many systems around the world, and I think that various forms of capitalism still are the best system that I have to get people educated and to get people to feel happy about themselves. The next panel is on the China model that Tom's going to come up right. and do. Do you think the China model might be better than our democracy in some ways? Well, better in what respect? If the, if the goal is ultimately to have a, a higher GDP, gross GDP, maybe it is. Maybe they will produce a higher GDP than we will. They have more people and they probably will in 10, 20 years have a higher GDP. If the standard is uh, per capita net income or if the standard is personal happiness, I'm not sure that the Chinese system will produce that. Also, while China has many virtues, and it does have the downside that you can argue that their people who are running the country were not elected in a popular way, and I would think that that is a system that everybody should, should be desirous of, which is having some real popular elections, even with the imperfections of the democratic system. Uh, you got involved in the China Leadership Initiative for the Aspen Institute. Uh, tell us why you did that and your connection to the Institute, if you would. Okay. Um, I, uh, my firm uh, became an early investor in China. I go there seven or eight times a year. Um, I have felt that uh, it is the great emerging market story of the 21st century. It will be the dominant economy of the 21st century. Um, we've made an uh, enormous number of investments there. About 15% of our entire workforce are Chinese natives who live in China. Many of them are educated in the United States, but have gone back to China. I just think it's a, it's a, it's a land rush, not unlike investing in the United States in the early part of the 20th century, or early part of the 19th century even. So I think it's a great economic opportunity and the, obviously the culture which has been around for thousands of years is endlessly um, interesting but I, I just find it to be a place where there's more e excitement about what's happening in the economy and more of a sense that we can accomplish something than sometimes I find in some parts of the United States. With respect to the Aspen Institute, um, I've you know, been uh, speaking for a couple years at the Aspen uh, Ideas Forum and found it to be um, you know, a very interesting uh, uh, group of people who come to speak and, and, and who attend and I thought that Aspen was, has done a wonderful job, and obviously under your leadership it's become even stronger than it ever was before. So I think it's a, you know, a wonderful thing for the country, and I just think that if we do have some great exports that we should have considered to export things more of, one of them is the Aspen Ideas Festival and equivalent things, and I know you're, you're thinking about it, but taking this idea that people from around the country interested in ideas, not just making money or just networking for business purposes, but interested in ideas to improve their brains, their soul, their happiness, um, come together is a really good thing, and I think it would be good if we could export this to China, among other places. One of the, thank you. One of the goals of this gathering is, after the Ideas Festival, turning ideas into action. That's what we're also doing with our uh, Young Leaders Group. And uh, it's something that you have truly embodied, both in your career, your philanthropy, and everything else. So I really want to thank you, David, for being My part pleasure. of this. Thank you. Thank and, you very much. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much. So, Bravo. Since uh, David uh, very 
neatly got us uh, involved with thinking about the China model. I'd like to call my friend Tom Pritzker, the CEO of the Pritzker Organization, also known here as the husband of Margot, up to the stage to lead us in a discussion on the China model and to thank Tom and Margot uh, for everything they've been doing uh, for this leadership initiative in the Institute. Thank, thank you. you. go here. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so our topic today is the China model and are there things that other countries can learn from the China model, either good or bad, things that they ought to try and uh, embrace and things, uh, lessons of things that they should try and stay away from. Uh, so let me briefly introduce our panel. Uh, to the far left is Indrani Bakshi. Indrani is the senior diplomatic editor of the Times of India, uh, where she reports and analyzes foreign policy issues for the newspaper. She covers India, US, China, Pakistan, terrorism, nuclear weapons, and lots of other fun things. Um, Indrani resides in uh, New Delhi. She's a fellow of the third class of the India Leadership Initiative and a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. So thank you for doing this. Uh, second is Desmond, Desmond Shum. Desmond is chairman of the Great Ocean Group, uh, honorary trustee at Tsinghua University in Beijing, a member of the 12th session of Beijing Political Consultative Con uh, Conference. Beginning in 2007, uh, Desmond and his wife have been active in establishing a series of not-for-profit foundations, uh, which work mainly in the areas of humanities, social sciences, and the arts. Uh, in 2011, Desmond established the uh, Tsinghua Kaifeng Family Heritage Center dedicated to nurturing exceptional family heritage. Uh, Desmond is a 2005 Crown Fellow. Uh, Delhi, Delhi Oljede Ol is Delhi. So Delhi's primary activity is he's an avid and frustrated golfer. <laughs> um, in his spare time, Delhi is publisher of uh, and chairman of Next, Next on Sunday, 234next.com, which provide news and informed opinion primarily for a Nigerian audience to further the common good. Also in his spare time, uh, Delhi won a Pulitzer Prize. He was the former foreign editor uh, at New York Newsday and relevant to this panel was bureau chief in Beijing. He's a member of the governing board of the Aspen Institute's Africa Leadership Initiative. Uh, he's a fellow of the second class of the Africa uh, Leadership Initiative in South Africa. And Delhi is also the 2011 uh, winner of the John P. McNulty Prize. So thank you all for doing this. Uh, let's start and let me ask Indrani. So you look at China from the Indian perspective. Uh, you've been doing this for many years. Can I ask you to pick one or two things in terms of China's domestic political system that you admire or you think uh, we should be staying away from that are lessons that India might learn from the China model? Well, one of the things that I, um, I admire most and many Indians do when you get into China is, uh, is the fact that their political system actually takes decisions and uh, <laughs> executes, <laughs> executes uh, uh, large visions, uh, implements, uh, puts into, on, on the ground uh, ideas that uh, uh, they've had, and you can see that. It's something that uh, <clears throat> our political system could learn a lot. Uh, what about bothers me about the Chinese uh, political system, of course, is that it is not elected. Um, and that uh, to an outsider, at least to an Indian, uh, our, we are so used to uh, having a political system where we let it all hang out. But um, to, be, to confront a political system where everybody sticks to the script, everybody has the same um, 
uh, everybody says the same thing, does the same thing, and, uh, and you actually don't know how they got there, um, that would keep me awake at night. Delic, same question. Um, I think, as Indrani said, one thing that one would admire if you live in a chaotic country where things can't uh, uh, get done, uh, certainly not important things, um, you all kind of fancy a sort of magic bullet solution. And when you see a country that is able to marshal enormous resources uh, very quickly to attack big problems, <coughs> Uh, there is a part of you that wants that. So I have some grudging admiration for that. Um, the uh, other thing is that there is a, a seemingly remarkable consensus about uh, at least China's short-term direction, uh, and certainly uh, amongst the elites in China. And that uh, you know, says uh, a lot for a country that's trying to get to a certain destination. Uh, my biggest problem with the China model can be expressed uh, in, uh, with a real issue that we've experienced a lot in Nigeria and places around Africa, which is that, for example, if ExxonMobil was uh, screwing things up in the Niger Delta, um, we have mechanisms for fighting ExxonMobil, including suing them in U.S. courts, including getting allies at the Aspen Institute and elsewhere to put pressure on ExxonMobil to do the right thing. If uh, Snook, uh, which I think is what uh, the Chinese National Oil Company is pronounced, C-N-O-O-C, yeah. uh, if they do the same thing, Snook, if they do the same thing, uh, we have no recourse. So uh, we suddenly would not be able to sue them in Beijing or in Shanghai. So I wouldn't be uh, very anxious to jump on the Chinese bandwagon in terms of their political system. So let me ask you something. You use the term grudging admiration and short term. There's something inside of there that isn't sure. Um, recently in China, I believe, they did actually shut down the idea of a, a plan for a chemical plant. Right. Right? Because of popular opinion. There mm -hmm. was there was a clear expression that this that people didn't want this. Do you see progress in China along those lines? Yeah, well, clearly. Even when I lived in China in the late 90s, uh, it was almost measurable year to year. There is progress in China, mm -hmm. even in those areas. Uh, people tend to forget that there is a lot of uh, personal space for individuals in China to pursue their uh, lives' uh, ambitions. Uh, you only come into conflict with the state when you are doing something that the state does not want you to do. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's a very significant room for doing your own thing. So there is progress in China. But if you ask me to choose under what system I would prefer to live in, I would not prefer to live under the Chinese system. So you don't buy the model that is, um, that is very harsh in terms of personal liberties and tries to develop the economy for social good? Uh, well, it's a, there is an inherent tension in that, and uh, because I understand the extraordinary deprivation that some African societies, for example, go through because they have such broken political systems, um, I would be slightly sympathetic to some version of the Chinese model, shall we say, more towards the Singaporean version of the Chinese model, uh, to bring some order and efficiency to some of these societies uh, in the short term of you know, a couple of generations and then slowly relax. Mm -hmm. As we saw in Korea, for example, uh, lived uh, for God knows 10, four decades, five decades under various military dictators until they finally got themselves out of that. There is something to be said for that. And I stood on this same stage last summer at the Ideas Festival uh, saying that, you know, we probably should start rethinking the idea of universal suffrage. It wasn't uh, a, I mean, it was meant to provoke at some level, but it's also true that there is not a single example of a successful democracy that had universal franchise from the beginning. So there is something to say for the citizens being developed to a certain level where there is a full understanding of the responsibilities and the privileges of citizenship before everybody has all of these rights and rights and rights. So I'm not totally into uh, 
this universal franchise myself. Certainly, I'm not that hot on it as I used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have some sympathy for the Chinese model because of their own peculiar circumstances. They've gone through a century of complete chaos and war and uh, various other disasters. So after a while, it might make sense for them uh, or it might become uh, unavoidable for them to uh, change the system they currently run. I don't think it's sustainable. Desmond, will you respond to each of Indrani and Delic, what are they getting right and what are they getting wrong on, on the domestic political structure? Um, on the political structure, I think, you know, first of all, I mean, China is, as you, know, you were saying, it's, it's a continuous involvement. I mean, it's, it will not, I mean, one of the things I think is completely wrong is in uh, the outside world, the moment they open a newspaper, it's a communist state. Okay, what does it mean to be a communist state? I mean, how it's, how it's being run is completely different. I mean, if you look at the uh, successive administrations, every administration is in terms of authoritative power is lesser than the previous one. So when Mao come on, one man, he said he say it's only say and the final say. When Deng come on, he, uh, Deng Xiaoping come on, he has consulted two, three elders. It's not his only say anymore. He need to make compromise. When Jiang come on, you know, Deng Xiaoping is still alive. He need to, he need to listen to Deng Xiaoping and then also a lot of action. So every state, I mean, until this, uh, even until this administration is actually evolving. The power is, is more dispersed now. So I think, you know, just look at China as one single entity and say, this is it. And this is communist state, it's an authoritative state. I think that's not correct. Uh, in terms of China model, I, I you know, actually have a session before this uh, about China model. Uh, actually, in, in, in funny thing is uh, I, I actually sponsor, we, we sponsor a, a think tank in, uh, in China doing research on social policy and political system. And we actually have a debate on China model on that specific topic. I don't think that's a China model. I don't think that is in, within China, Chinese will say we have a Chinese model. You know, if you look at, you know, this saying everybody, I think, today knows is uh, crossing the river, touching the stone. That is not a model. That is an adaptive step. That is feel my way and I will evolve and I will adapt on every step along the way. What, what model is that? That is a philosophy, you can say, but that is not a model. Okay, so let's turn to economics where there is a bit more of a model, actually, than an entire societal model. They're like, what are we, what's good and bad? If you, they've eliminated more poverty than ever in history over the last 20 years. Every data point you look at in terms of economics for China is not just good, it's truly Lovely historical choice. in terms of what they've done. Yeah. So what can we learn from that? What should, what should other countries look ah. at? The problem with this is uh, I don't think it's possible to divorce uh, political and economic models. Uh, so uh, I can talk in isolation really about the Chinese economic model, which I think flows directly from Chinese political system of governance. So, but that said, uh, and again, as I had said earlier, it is uh, not without uh, merit to argue that if you are a third world developing country, uh, the Chinese model, model, economic model has appeal. The ability to rapidly deploy the resources of a country towards certain limited goals, uh, efficiently and in a, well, maybe not efficiently, but certainly effectively in a short period of time, there is something to admire about that. It certainly beats uh, uh, chaos and inaction and I think in Drani's uh, 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 description or, or comparison of uh, India and China in that respect is, uh, is accurate. So I admire the ability to move rapidly, maybe because I have authoritarian tendencies myself, <laughs> uh, uh, to, to be able to take a decision and, uh, and, and roll with it. And uh, how about problems with it? Well, the problem again goes back to uh, if something goes wrong, what's the recourse? Right? I like to have a plan B, uh, certainly a, 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 an escape hatch. Uh, the, the Chinese uh, model, the political as well as the economic model may not necessarily provide you with that unless you escape from your house arrest in the middle of the night and run to the US Embassy in Beijing. Um, 
So, so I, 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 that, that's the weakness. The same weakness you have in the political system is the same weakness you have in the economic system, which is why they're facing all these very tremendous environmental challenges and so on, because there's more of a command and control uh, approach to getting these large things done. Some of them have a very good uh, outcome, but also have very, very high costs for ordinary Chinese citizens. And uh, you now begin to see the, the start of, a, of an environmental uh, movement in China, and citizens are pushing back every day about the kind of very high costs, intolerable costs they are paying uh, environmentally. So, Indrani, India and China is a comparison that we've all read about uh, who ends up ahead in 50 years and, and comparing whether it's the literacy or the poverty rates or all of these data points. Um, they're just very, very different. Not only different systems, but they're also different cultures and societies. So what, what could India do better looking, looking at how China's done it? What would you take from China? Well, I think it's, uh, it's popular now to, um, to look at China's investment-led model, and China has, a, has an investment-led model, which has delivered phenomenal growth rates over the last uh, decades. Um, we could do a little bit of that, uh, but if you look at the Chinese consumption, and China, China really needs to, at this point, um, needs to turn around and become a more consumption-led model. Uh, India, on the other hand, is a consumption-led model. I'm not sure we've done so well on the investment. Um, in fact, as somebody said, China creates the, creates the supply and then waits for the demand to fill it up. India waits for the demand to reach, reach acute proportions before uh, getting the supply lines out. Um, but to be fair, A, we should be able to uh, work on our GDP growth, growth rates because as we have seen in China, rising tide raises all boats and uh, we could do it with a little bit of that. Um, on the other hand, if, the, if China's economy, uh, the model, fails if it, if the land if china's landing is is a hard landing that would have huge implications for us and for the rest of the world and that's something uh, we do worry about uh, within the chinese system a third issue about the Chi about china's um, economic model is how uh, it is how it is so tied to uh, chinese citizens acceptance of the Chinese Communist Party, that the Chinese Communist Party delivers growth rates of 8-9% uh, in return for Chinese people accepting the loss of or lack uh, of freedom or lack of uh, privileges uh, to be able to, uh, that, that kind of a contract. And uh, you're actually, it's like watching a timer. It, when does the growth rate, I mean, what happens? What what happens to security when uh, growth rates go down to five, four, uh, six? Is, is that the tipping point for uh, large-scale social unrest? And that's something that both economists and uh, political scientists worry often about China. It's not something that we worry about in India because we do go through 8% um, uh, growth rates and then uh, slump to a 5% as we are today. But we are not looking at India and wondering whether, the, whether the, it will result in a revolution. We'll just have to wait for next year and vote the government out. Uh, but beyond that, we don't, we don't really worry that much about the stability of, this, of society. And One I think that's something we need to worry about. One quick thing about China and India, as Indran was talking, I remember this. If you are very poor, you're better off living in China. That's mm -hmm. true. And mm -hmm. if you're not so very poor, you're better off living mm -hmm. in India. Yeah, and I think that's a helpful sure. way of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, Desmond, our experience at Hyatt is kind of interesting, and it, it supports what Indrani's saying. When we go to do a hotel in a city in China, the major issue is really a planning issue, and is this good for the local government in the sense of how's it look on their dossier? Are they going to get promoted if they put a fancy new Hyatt in their, in their city? And they'll want to do a gleaming multi-use project for what I'll call political and honestly personal advancement. I'm not talking about corruption, just in terms of being able to show off their city. 
the issue of return on investment and that sort of thing is very secondary. When we then go to India and have the same conversation, the guy is sitting there with a pencil and saying, are you crazy? 14.3% isn't enough. Get me 14.45% and then I'll go ahead and do the deal. Now the problem in India is he can't get a permit to do it. We can get him the 15%, or oh, he can't get the land, he can't get the permit. But it's a very different model. I, I, I do look and I see, I have concerns about the China economic model because if it doesn't have sound economics that are driving these developments, eventually you can end up in trouble. Desmond, are we gonna, so what Entrani said and what I also believe is the real problem is the risk of a significant event in China. Um, do we, how do you see that risk? I think that's two things here. One is uh, I completely with, agree with Dali. I mean, the political system and the economy system in China is inseparable. I mean, because state-owned enterprise di have direct control on about 30% of the economy. And plus, obviously, the government completely control all the banks. So, so that too is inseparable. And they are the arms of the, the government or the party to execute. So um, in terms of a significant economic event, I think it's just two things. One is actually, well, I mean, that's debate right now going on is how, how much debt is the government does have. I mean, that is, you know, say last time, you know, financial crisis, they pumped four trillion RMB into the system, which is equivalent to about 800 million. And they say a lot of this going, went to waste. As a result, there's a lot of hidden debt at the provincial and the local level. But uh, exactly what it is, it's not known. But despite whatever it is, the official number at today's number, China has 20%. A, a, a debt, to, uh, debt to GDP is about 20%, which is very, very low. So you say you, you double that, say 40%. I mean, there are some estimates of 40, 50%. Even if it's 40, 40, 40, 50% compared to what, what a Western country or globally. I mean, it's, that's a very, very tolerable um, uh, number. So they do have a capacity to adjust and they sort of do another pumping if that is needed. So I, I don't think that is a, a risk uh, in terms of on an on a economy, economy side. I think the risk is more on the longer term because of you know, the growth and because of wealth and people getting, you know, once you get, you know, like you, what you're just saying, once you get a certain long time of wealth, you want different things. You know, when, when I first start, uh, when people just first start, they say, well, just get me the next meal, right? And then they say, well, get me the next house. And then when, when they have all that, they say, well, they were higher, you know, higher level of wishes and, or demand of, of fulfilling or you call it individuation, right? Then that's the point. That's the point is say, can the government over time deliver on that? Because now it seems with the technology enabling, you are seeing more and more voice, a bigger, bigger of the society say, I want my rights. And then what are my rights? How, am I to, how are you going to protect my rights? So that is more, that's coming. And that's like a rising tide. So the government needs to deliver according to that. And can you deliver according to that? If you are really have this mismatch, then the question becomes at a risk is say, is there something like a, like a match to us, you know, like a pivotal event, all of a sudden you swing the country. I mean, that's, there is always this question because there are a lot of, I mean, even that's, that's even within the government, within the most senior official of the government. It's like, if we're not delivering according to that wish, which is rising, would that come to an inflection point? Something may flip. So briefly, one of the things they're gonna, that they're gonna need to do to make that work is develop more of a consumer demand. The investment model, it can only take it so far. Do you think they'll be able to make that pivot and their political and, and social uh, aspects to that question, but do you think China's gonna be able to make the pivot and develop consumer demand? Uh, I have two responses to it. One, the first thing is you look at the, the last 10 years, the priority of the government has been changing. I mean, to the point of this administration say, GDP number is not my priority. It's overall delivery. And then so they, they, they actually look at it. They put uh, welfare of the peasants for as a first priority. You know, Chinese, uh, every year they have a, like a number one 
directive, and that's supposedly the most important directive from the central government. And for many years, peasants, welfare of the citizen is the first one. And so, and then now in the last few years, you say, okay, there's a migrant worker. There's like 200 million migrant worker into the city. The, their rights are getting protected. Mm -hmm. You know, they are going to be rec recognized in the last 12 months. The new latest news, they're going to re recognize as a citizen of the city instead of lock into the land in the, in the countryside. So the government is trying to deliver on that side, and they're seeing that, they are seeing that uh, the ability or the urgency to deliver on that side. I think on the, on the economy side, on the consumption side, I mean, the government obviously, with the urge of gr the global urge, all these trade frictions, and also say, well, you export so much, you're, taking all, you're sucking in all this capital globally. Uh, uh, I mean, the government just is, is trying to do something. But the thing is, uh, I think it uh, it's, hasn't been really working. The policy hasn't been working. I mean, the latest round now, they are trying to, again, to have another set of policy came out in the last three months, trying to encourage that. Yeah. You need to see how that works. In China? The, uh, I think, say, the Chinese consumption rates are at, I think, 3.4% of the GDP. For the, I think the Chinese will be able to turn it around. Uh, but there it, but it, it, to turn a system from an investment-led system to a uh, consumption-led system takes a while. Uh, the, the difficulty is not that they will be able to do it. The difficulty is what happens in that interim period. I mean, the, whether, that is, uh, whether that is tied to social unrest, political unrest. And you have seen, I mean, China, China I spends more on internal security than on external security, on its, its defense budget. Uh, the uh, internal security component is higher than all other components. They do worry about it, and you can see that they worry about that. So uh, uh, I think that is, the, the, that is the concern, is in that process, at which point does the Chinese citizen turn around and say, this is not a good idea? Yeah. I think to be fair to the Chinese government, if we look at the last you know, 60 years or so, 55, 60 years, uh, the Communist Party in China has proved itself quite adept at adapting, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Uh, but the point that Idrani was making is if you hit a certain speed bump, for example, around the economy, which is what the political consensus has developed around, and the economy takes a downturn, and we know everything that goes up must come down, um, uh, uh, can the system respond speedily and adequately to that change and let there be avenues for blowing off steam in it or does it lead to outright yeah. chaos? We already know, I think I saw some numbers about 700,000 protests of some sort or the other a year in China, uh, mostly in the rural areas of course. So can the system adapt enough and quickly enough uh, to, to ac accommodate those kinds of demands I think the jury is out on that, yeah. and I think that's the main risk yeah, the, they the, face. The issue of agility and resilience and is a critical issue, and central planning isn't exactly built for yeah. that sort of thing. And all elites uh, you know, become blind at some point yeah. and uh, don't see it coming. Except for you. <laughs> um, so let's turn to foreign <laughs> policy. Uh, Indrani, so China and India had a war in 1962. Uh, they are both allies and rivals, depending on what issue you look at. You have huge imports coming from China, and yet there are also uh, border issues and some more serious issues. How do you think about China's foreign policy towards India? How do you think about how China looks at India and deals on a bilateral basis with India? So. Um, <clears throat> So yes, as you said rightly, we had a war in 1962. Uh, it's the only war we have lost in uh, independent India's history. And as a nation, we have not overcome that loss. It's honest, honestly, yeah. we have, there has been no national catharsis. And that in, that, the loss of that war informs all our uh, perceptions about China. Uh, China, in. Uh, I would say we are not actually rivals. We are not competitors, we are not rivals. I mean, look at China, China's three times India's size in terms of its economy. Um, we have a border problem, and therefore China will always be 
the largest strategic ta challenge to India. Um, why? I think uh, we are, we are look, you're looking at two uh, huge nations rising at more or less the same time. China's a couple of decades ahead of us. Uh, but both nations rising, both nations feeling its way uh, around the uh, neighborhood. Both nations will come into conflict uh, with each other with two very different strategic visions for it themselves. Uh, they will come into, con uh, come into confrontation, um, uh, if not physically, but certainly in the realm of uh, strategy and in the realm of diplomacy. Uh, we, are, we watch with, uh, not with so much concern uh, at how China has actually messed up its foreign policy in the last few years uh, in the neighborhood. Um, has done pretty badly uh, because in, at least in the last three years, China has successfully turned a number of its neighbors against itself. Mm -hmm. And that takes some doing. Uh, it's not just us. Uh, if you look around, in fact, uh, I would con I would concern if I was China because if I look around, I'd see that I have my two of my best friends in the region, in North Korea and Pakistan. What does that say about me? And uh, so it, it, these are. I would say China would, and, and I think China's recognized. And we, uh, in in the neighborhood, we gave. I think everybody gave China time because it was the uh, uh, 2012, 2011, 2012 were the years of their leadership transition. There was the aggression. Everybody made allowances for that aggression uh, in the neighborhood. I think that has gone to a stage where people are not willing to do that, make those, allow th make those allowances anymore. And uh, you do, you can see America's back in the region. Uh, the, Filip the Filipinos are fighting, fighting with the Chinese. And they have no hope in hell of being able to win that war. All but right. they're fighting, and that's, you know. Let me, uh, so let me turn to Africa. One comment I'd make is India-China relationship isn't just to the north of India. It's also in the Indian Ocean. You've got to so look we have at that. A, yeah, we have this great thing called the String of Pearls. Yeah. If, uh, for everybody who, that there is a String of Pearls that uh, uh, we see and that bothers us. Uh, we are doing, there are countermeasures that we can talk about later. We, the Indians are doing their own countermeasures. But so it's, yep. you know, it's two nations jostling with each other. To, let me turn to Africa. And what, how, how do you think about China's policy there? Well, I mean, China has a voracious appetite for natural resources, uh, you know, energy principally. And so what's basically going on in Africa is uh, China comes to you and says, you have this coal. If you give us access to it, we'll, let, let you, we'll help you build the football stadium, highway, and so on. Um, and uh, that seems to be... Uh, done fairly rapidly and it impresses a lot of Africans who have never seen any government of theirs do something that is yeah. substantial uh, in a short period of time. Then the honeymoon wore off and the first signs of that we saw was uh, in the Zambian elections a couple of years ago where the incumbent uh, government uh, was defeated at the polls on a singular issue of its coziness with the Chinese because they thought that not only were the Chinese coming uh, to uh, get involved in the Zambian economy in a, in a major way, but they were also bringing manual labor. So it became a serious uh, issue in, in Zambia. Uh, a couple of months ago uh, in, in Ghana, uh, in the northern parts of Ghana, they found that there were 5,000 or so illegal Chinese uh, miners uh, who were just you know, pr practically using uh, spades and, 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 and picks to dig gold and stuff from the ground. Uh, these were all from a particular uh, town in, in southern China. Uh, so there are a lot of issues that are bubbling up uh, that are making the relationship very complicated between the Chinese and the Africans. But largely, I think it must be admitted that China has moved very aggressively and very quickly in helping a lot of African countries deal with certain infrastructure uh, uh, projects, uh, obviously in exchange for having access to, to natural resources. And so that relationship would only get increasingly more complicated 
uh, love-hate relationship. And uh, I look at uh, the traditional uh, uh, allies or governments that used to be involved in Africa, principally the European powers, France, England, and to a significant extent also the United States, sort of standing on the sidelines, somewhat envious yeah. about the ability of China to pour money into these places, but also sort of thinking, okay, what do we do and what should our response be? So African elites, on the one hand, uh, uh, would rather seek the protection of the US and the UK and France. Uh, but at the same time, they like the cash that comes from the Chinese. I mean, who wouldn't? If somebody's handing you cash, uh, you say thank you and you, and you accept. <laughs> Okay, so I want to turn to questions from the audience, but before I do that, I, I've been admiring uh, Deleg's watch. Is that Mao? <laughs> That's Mao saying so goodbye. His watch is Mao <laughs> waving at something or other. Um, so for transparency, I want you to know he wears a Mao Zedong watch. Uh, okay, let's go, let's go to questions. Um, any of the topics we covered or Thank anything you. else on the China model? Well, yeah, back there, the Same lady, time. yeah, lady in white. Where else? So I guess the question goes like this. I mean, China did an amazing job in, in, in the last 20 years of taking, I don't know whether the figure is 300 million or 500 million out of poverty. Um, and it wasn't planned, OK? Now, as the panel has accurately described, there's this enormous political pressure on the Chinese government to give the next chance for uh, the other three-fourths of the country or half of the country that's still in the rural sector that's not yet seen, that's made huge sacrifices for the Chinese growth, uh, but have not yet seen the benefits of that growth. Recently, the New York Times described a centrally led plan to bring 200 million Chinese out of the rural sector and into new, new urban towns, centrally planned towns where they would have urban housing, where they would be off the land, where they would have credit. Um, and, and that started. The New York Times just started to do a, a series of articles on that. I, I, I'm wondering if someone on the panel could talk about um, the dangers of that kind of centrally planned model or the benefits and what they think of that uh, as a way of relieving this tremendous political pl pressure and how they, how they see that going forward. Okay, so the question is urbanization in China. Uh, the view is from an economic point of view, urbanization is going to drive uh, GDP growth. There are obviously issues around uh, urbanization. Desmond, right down the middle. <laughs> I, I think you mentioned two points. Uh, one is about the split between basically the game of economic growth between the rural and the urban. And the second is this latest movement. Uh, I think the first thing is uh, China basically grow by urbanization grow by one point, one percentage point on a yearly basis, which means one percentage point means what? Uh, 12 million people move from the countryside to the city on a, on a yearly basis. And then China just passed 50 percent uh, urbanization rate like three years ago, I think. Uh, I, well, the, the one, but the promises is not correct. Your promise is not correct in the sense it wasn't the rural get left behind. It was the split wasn't even. So. So the, 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 the urban population income are growing, let's say, 15%. When, when, the, when the countryside is growing at 5 and 6%. So on the, and then you average out, you say the whole country is growing at 10. So, so on the absolute level, everybody is rising. But it's a split that's not even. In terms of the latest uh, thing, it's not, it's not, it's actually two, actually it's two things here. I think it's, you got uh, mixed in here. One is that the government do an, uh, make an announcement and make coming up with policies to encourage growth of second tier and third tier cities. The, the issue is twofold. One is we got too many people in the first tier cities. 
So I think uh, of the top 10 cities, most populous country in the w uh, cities in the world, uh, seven of them are in China. So Beijing has, both Beijing and Shanghai have over 20 million people. And then you get, you know, you, you create a lot of urban problem, traffic, healthcare, you know, all these issues. So the, so the government say, well, we need to create, and then, and, and then this, and then being the top cities in each problem, you draw, you suck in more and more resources and the human talent. So we need to disperse those resources and disperse those talent to the second and third tier cities. And that way I can also create another way of growth. Yeah. So that is the, that is where the, where the, where the, um, uh, urban urban policies going in terms of 200 million number you mentioned i think it's not they want to they're going to move 200 people 200 million people to the city it's 200 million people migrant workers are already in the city but in the past that we have separate what we call huko you know separate identity cars so you're locking in instead of lock into your city lock into your land so the peasants have this identity card they be, you know even you have you work in the you work in the city, your children are born in the city, they don't get the right as the city citizens. They are still have get, you know, they still need to get their health care, education back in the countryside. What they are now doing is say they are starting to recognize those people who have moved into the city and have children born into the city and giving them the same right as city citizens. So it's not really moving 200 people into the city, it's giving them recognition. Thanks. Um, I think we are going to call it a day. We're out of time. I apologize. We didn't have time for other questions. Uh, obviously, China is an issue that's going to continue to be on our horizon, uh, frankly, for the rest of our lives. It's something that is going to be profoundly important to all of our lives. And um, so I want to thank the panel for all the thoughts and ideas that you've surfaced. Thanks very much. Can you leave, yeah, yes, leave yeah. your... You okay? Uh, huh? Hello, madam. Uh, yes, I'm gonna. I've lost control, I apologize. Um, we're, we're, we want to introduce the next panel now. So my job at this point is to uh, introduce the moderator for the next panel. Uh, Suzanne Malveaux, the CNN anchor, I don't think requires much of an introduction. Uh, other than to advertise that she is a Henry Crown Fellow. Yes. That's the most important thing. <laughs> uh, and she's going to lead us in a conversation with uh, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, or former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. So thank you very all much. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. If you could all take your seats. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, we want to start off, obviously we will introduce the secretary, but I'd like to start off by introducing our panel first. We're going to try to get through as many things as quickly as possible because we'd love to get the audience to be able to get some questions in during our session, our conversation with the former secretary of state. I'd like to start first of all by saying we have a panel that represents the globe, uh, around the world, really an extraordinary group of people. It's going to be very brief, however, uh, just so we can squeeze in as much as possible. I'd like to start off with our first panelist, Shadia El Mayushi. Shadia. She is managing partner, when it's sit there. Shadia. She is managing partner of Badri and Salam El Shadia Law Firm. 
It is the oldest regional law firm offices in Lebanon and Qatar. Uh, she is co-founder of the Middle East Leadership Initiative and a 2008 Henry Crown Fellow. And we asked each one of them what they wanted to do, their second act or their previous act. She says she wanted to be a spy like one of the James Bond girls. <laughs> Kathleen Gahn, she is the Chief Financial and Risk Officer for Global Commercial Banking, HSBC. She's a 2008 Henry Crown Fellow of the Aspen Institute based in Hong Kong. And she has worked in more than 25 countries, 50 cities, and she wanted to be a ballerina. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, next in our panel, Ali Mufuruki, uh, that is. He is co-founder of the Africa Leadership Initiative at the Aspen Institute. And he is, uh, has a BS in mechanical engineering and design. He and his four children live in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, he is a 2001 Henry Crown Fellow. And uh, he wanted to be a boxer. <laughs> Ali, welcome. Gigi Porras, she is the former Minister of Commerce and Industry in Panama. She is a fellow of the Central America Leadership Initiative. And she always wanted to be, she says, a singer, a dancer, like Madonna, she says, the material girl. That is Gigi for you. Thank you to our panel. Now, when I was asked to uh, moderate this panel with uh, Secretary Albright, I was certainly honored. I had a, a chance to, to speak with her and see her in action in the Clinton years, uh, traveling to, to Europe and Africa, Latin America. And uh, she was so gracious and kind. We had breakfast this morning, so I learned a lot of other things about her. Uh, one of the things that I asked her this morning was, what should I address you? Should it be Dr. Albright, uh, Madam Secretary? And she simply said, Madeline, as in Cher or Madonna or <laughs> Beyonce, somebody who needs no last name. So. Uh, she, she's very modest, and, uh, but I do want to go over her resume, her bio, briefly uh, because it does give us a sense of the context of this conversation and what she brings to the table. I promise I will get back to some of the things that I learned during breakfast as well. Madeline Albright is currently chair of the Albright Stonebridge Group. It is a global strategy firm. She is also chair of Albright Capital Management, an investment advisory firm focused on emerging markets. She is chair of the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs. And as we all know, she made history as the 67th Secretary of State for the United States, as the first female to hold this position. She was the highest ranking woman in the history of US government in 1997. As Secretary of State, she reinforced America's alliances, advocated for democracy and human rights, promoted American trade, bound business, labor, and environmental standards abroad. From 1993 to 1997, Dr. Albright served as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, was a member of the President's Cabinet, and always those who were impressed with her, there was an ongoing campaign for her to run as U.S. President. We know she cannot do that, being born in Czechoslovakia, but there was always a campaign for her to actually uh, rise to that occasion. She currently today is, pre is professor in the practice of diplomacy at the Georgetown University uh, School of Foreign Service. She serves on numerous boards, the U.S. Department of Defense's Defense Policy Board, Council on Foreign Relations, the Aspen Institute, of course, the Center for American Progress. She is the author of four New York Times bestsellers. And the last time she was at the White House, she was with President Obama receiving the nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So here's what I learned at breakfast. Uh, right around the corner from where she lives, her neighbor is uh, the uh, cur current Secretary of State, John Kerry. Her BFF, it should come as no surprise, Hillary Clinton. She has uh, three daughters, two who are twins. Her youngest one, Katie, is here in the audience. And I asked her about a report where she said she could leg press 400 pounds. I said, is this true? She said, absolutely not. 450. <laughs> <laughs> 
she is not someone to be messed with, I, I would like to uh, welcome uh, <laughs> Madeline, <laughs> former Secretary of State, to our Hello. panel. Thank you so thank much. You. Suzanne, uh, I uh, want to thank you for telling everybody who I am because not everybody always knows. I had, uh, not long ago, was coming back from China and Chicago was the first port of entry, and I was there getting undressed for the security people, and I put my stuff down on the conveyor belt, and the lady behind me said, so where'd you get all those screw top bottles? My bottles all leak, so at the container store. And then I was going through the magnetometer, and the TSA guard looked at me, and he said, oh my God, it's you. Uh, he said, I'm from Bosnia, and we all love you in Bosnia, and if it weren't for you, there wouldn't be a Bosnia, and you're welcome in Bosnia and can I have my picture taken with you? So we stop the whole line, I have the picture taken. <laughs> I go back to get my stuff, and the lady of the screw top bottle says, so what exactly happened here? I said, well, I used to be Secretary of State, and she said, of Bosnia, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we know you here. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm going to uh, kick off the questioning. Two, two uh, questions, one, one um, funny, one, one serious. But tell us about your pin, because you would not give that away this morning, which pin yeah. you're wearing today for this occasion. Well, I, I am now known for my pins as a new tool of diplomacy. And so this is practicing cultural diplomacy. This is a uh, Native American pin uh, by, made by the Zunis. And I really thought that it was appropriate here in the West, where I am. I grew up in Denver, so I'm very comfortable at home and very glad to All right. Thank support you. this. Yeah. Uh, let's kick off the conversation. I want to ask you, uh, as an immigrant, as somebody who comes from a, a family who survived the Holocaust, uh, as someone who has a great deal of pride in this country, uh, this is a war-weary place, uh, with, with wars Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Syria, and Egypt. What do you believe is the role right now of the United States um, in, in its position in the globe? Well, I don't want to compete with David, but I grew up, was raised a Catholic, married an Episcopalian, and found out I was Jewish. Therefore, <laughs> guilt is one of my uh, <laughs> major actors. Um, I feel I did come here as a child at age 11. and. Uh, my father was a Czechoslovak diplomat, and we spent the war in England, and then went back to Czechoslovakia, then came to the United States when the communists took over Czechoslovakia. And so, for me, without insulting any of the wonderful foreigners that are here, for me, the biggest thing that ever happened in my life was coming to America and becoming an American. And, um, and I really felt in my own life story that when the U.S. wasn't present, bad things happened. Uh, as somebody who was born, as I said, in Czechoslovakia, Munich was the most outrageous thing that happened when the British and French uh, sold the country, uh, having made a deal with the um, Germans and Italians, they basically sold Czechoslovakia down the river, and the United States wasn't there. Uh, the, then, during World War II, when the Americans came in, I was a little girl in England, you could see the American soldiers, and you could feel that something different was going to happen. Then when as a result of agreements made during World War II, <clears throat> the Americans did not liberate Czechoslovakia, uh, even though General Patton was kind of 45 miles in, and the Soviets, quote, liberated the country, uh, terrible things happened. The Iron Curtain came down. So for me, the theme always has been, what is America's role? And so I believe in an active American role. We have responsibilities in the world. Uh, we can, I believe, in the goodness of American power, and so I want to see us active. But uh, I think it's very important that whatever we do be in partnership with others. And when I was at the UN, President Clinton said it first, but I said this so often, it all became identified with me, that we are the indispensable nation. And there is nothing in the word indispensable that says alone. It just says we need to be engaged. And so I feel very strongly that the U.S. needs to be actively engaged in the international community trying to figure out how to deal with the problems that we're going to be talking about. All right. Shadia, if you'd like to start with your first question. Yes. So I also feel strongly that the U.S. should be highly engaged in the international community. I also think they should be very well engaged. So my question is that um, the U.S. has been um, financing nearly for the last 10 years, every year, 
billions of dollars, close to 30 billions of dollars every year on the fight um, against terrorism and specifically um, against Al-Qaeda and similar movements. So at the same time, in, uh, it's one of its uh, strong allies in the Middle East, with Saudi Arabia, um, is financing in similar amounts, billions of dollars every year, uh, madrasas and, and schools and mosques that um, propagate the fundamentalist Islam ideologies that then lead to, uh, that, that find themselves in some of these movements like Al-Qaeda. So my question is, what do you think the U.S. ought to do about this and what do you think it will do about this in the coming years? Well, I think that it points up the complications of foreign policy in the 21st century. Uh, I do think that uh, the United States needs to fight terrorism. I happen to believe that um, the statement about war on terrorism was a, uh, a real mistake because what happened, uh, we got involved in this <clears throat> after 9-11 and the people who hit the towers in uh, New York were, were murderers, plain and simple. And by talking about a war on terrorism, we made them warriors in their own societies and glorified a lot about it. So I think that that has been a mistake and I'm uh, very uh, appreciative of the way that the Obama administration is now dealing with terrorism as a whole. I do think also that the Saudis uh, have a, a mixed record on a number of different issues. Um, I think there are groups that do exactly what you're talking about, but also, and this is the hard part about actually being involved in decision making uh, for the United States government, is that we need the Saudis in a number of different places. We need to um, privately tell them things that we do not like that they're doing uh, in terms of uh, their way they treat women and a number of other issues. But the Saudis are important friends of the United States and important in terms of trying to get some kind of um, stability in the Middle East. But um, when you state it the way you did, it does seem completely contradictory. But when you actually get into these areas, they're a little bit more gray. Thank you. Kathleen? Yeah, um, so a report by the National Intelligence Council predicts that the United States may, may lose, it, lose its superpower status by 2030. Um, so my question is, how is U.S. dealing with the possibility that it may no longer be number one global power one day? And what is Washington doing to shape its policy strategically while it is still number one today so that it can set the rules and framework for the next number one, which potentially could be China? Um, it's very interesting um, that it goes back to something I said before in the question that you asked, but how do you see the United States' role? And um, I think, this may surprise you, but I think many, many Americans do not want to be the superpower. Um, many Americans, we like to be number one in sports and things, but <laughs> I do think that there is not this, we are not an imperialist power. Uh, we don't like the idea that we have uh, certain responsibilities, and one of the reasons that President Clinton and I started talking about indispensable was to kind of go against that feeling that Americans have. We've got a big country, we don't have to worry about others. So I, I think that this would not be a great shock. I think the issue really comes down to the following thing. The way that the world looks today, uh, it can't operate with just a superpower. It needs to have partners. It, there needs to be, I know Americans don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables and it ends in an ism. Uh, but basically it means partnership. And so I think many Americans would like to see another, well, China and other countries really play a larger role. That's the partnership part. And I also think the issue is something different, which is how to, and this is part of what the dialogue is with the Chinese today, is how do you get the Chinese to not just do what we heard at the last panel about going into some country and taking their resources and building them a road, uh, but to be co-responsible for a lot of the issues that are out there, whether it's dealing with terrorism, nuclear proliferation, uh, energy and environment issues, uh, the gap between the rich and the poor. So I think that's more what, where Americans would like to see things go. Thank you. Ali. Madam Secretary, um, the United States for many decades, if not centuries, has been seen, especially by young emerging democracies like those in Africa where I come from, as a model of freedom, as a model of opportunity, 
as a model of even justice. And um, many of our countries have been looking at the United States model as one that they could emulate for themselves as we learn to become democratic states. However, uh, the recent shooting uh, of an, an, an armed 17-year-old in Florida recently and the subsequent acquittal of his killer by an all-white jury kind of exposed, I think, not just to us, but I'm sure also to the United States, that the battle against racism is far from won 50 years after that hopeful speech by Martin Luther King. Now, we ask ourselves, why should we still continue looking at the United States as a model of a society we should emulate? I think that what happened, um, and I am not a lawyer, I am appalled by what happened uh, in that trial. I probably should keep my mouth shut on it because it's not my business, but I do think that it was a tragedy in every single way. I think what is great about America is that there still are more possibilities for people to have, as David was saying, pursuit of happiness and a way for people, you know, there are not a lot of countries where somebody who's an immigrant ends up as Secretary of State uh, or that has a, a black president when we are primarily a, a mixed country. And so there are many, many fabulous things about us. But I think what is most interesting about us is we are examining what just happened. What, this, what happened? Why did it happen? What can we do to make it different? And it is a constant kind of dialogue that goes on. I think that I am deeply troubled by the decision. I am deeply troubled by what is not so latent racism. But I do believe that this country is trying to figure it out. And if we are a model, it is that we question ourselves. Uh, we do have a system of government um, that, when it works properly, really does have checks and balances and tries to figure out the answers. And we, I, I do believe, I am a very proud American, and I do believe that we're going to figure this one out. But it is a mortifying and horrible thing, I think, that happened. I speak for myself in this. If I could just follow, because I know you and I discussed this briefly over breakfast, what do you think of the president's role, President Obama uniquely as being the first African-American president? I think, um, I think the president has, every president has a very difficult job at a time when there is a, a moral crisis or some terrible accident or, or kind of the leader in charge of various things. I find President Obama a remarkable figure in many ways. I told you this, uh, I think I told you this at breakfast, when I obviously was for Hillary Clinton. And when I was here, um, at the, when, just before the Democratic Convention, um, I listened to Barack Obama's, I listened to it, uh, Dreams of My Father, because I, he read it. And I thought, what an amazing story this man has, and what an amazing country, and I hoped he'd get elected. I worked very hard for his election, and I thought what an amazing story he has and how he has pulled um, his life together in a number of different ways. And so I think that, uh, I thought his speech was fantastic. I think, I'm very glad he gave it. I think he has a unique role to play, both as a president and as the first uh, African American president. And, and I think that we should all reread the speech because I think it was very carefully delivered, very carefully thought out, um, and I think it was remarkable. I, I really do. I think it was the right thing to do. All right, thank you. Gigi. Well, last but not least, we are yet so close but so apart between the, the U.S. and Central America. When is Central America going to be in the U.S. agenda far beyond the issues on border control, far beyond drugs, trafficking, immigrations, money laundering, what happened to the dreams of pathways to prosperity and all that? Well, um, I have to say this is one of the great difficulties of American foreign policy is trying to have the right relationship, the correct relationship with all of Latin America. I can tell you from my own experience, you're damned if you do or damned if you don't. Yes. <laughs> we either are not paying attention to you 
-hmm. for whatever reason, and you say exactly what you just said, or we're paying too, too much, much attention, attention. <laughs> and you're saying, why are you meddling in our affairs? Um, <laughs> I think that um, it is very important that we see the strength of the Americas. I have to tell you, the most revolutionary thing I did while I was in the State Department was make sure that Canada was in the Western Hemisphere. Okay. Um, <laughs> according to the State Department, just so you know, according to the State Department, Canada was in Europe. Okay. Um, and so I actually thought it is in the Western Hemisphere. It should be in the Western Hemisphere. And the reason that I did it um, was that I so believe in the strength of the Americas and operating together and understanding that we are linked by our desires for democracy and, um, and good economic life. So, but part of the problem is you. Uh, because what I said is absolutely true. I mean, I, ha I went to many meetings with Central American foreign ministers, and sometimes they'd say, leave us alone. Yes. And other times, why haven't you been here more often? So that, that is the problem. But I think generally, we have to figure out what our real relationship is uh, in this hemisphere um, and recognize the strength that we have if we operate as, as uh, democracies with liberal economic systems. And I guess first understanding if we want to be together as a region, I guess. I think that is also part of it. You guys have to like each other. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I like the way this is moving along. I think we get a second more round with our questioners, if we can kind of keep the pace there, and then we can get uh, our audience to start participating. So Sharia. Yeah, so my, se my second question is one that is very deep to, into my heart as an Arab, and it's, I think, very important for Arabs, Israelis, Americans, and its perception of America in the Middle East and worldwide. So it's on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And my, my question is, what is the U.S. planning to do about this? taking into in consideration two things specifically. So first, the increasing Palestinian population. Right now, you have 20% Palestinians uh, in Israel, within Israel. And if you take West Bank, Gaza, and Israel, you're, you're at uh, nearly half-half population. So, and that's increasing immensely. And then the second uh, uh, issue that to take into consideration is all the Arab risings that have been happening and the power of numbers. And taking into, into consideration these two facts, demographics, power, uh, and Arab risings. What are you planning to do about the, the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict and to resolve Well, I, I have to say, Secretary Kerry is doing an incredible job uh, trying to deal with an issue that has been out there for a long time. All of us that have been in positions of either ambassadors or secretaries of state know that um, this is an essential issue that has to be dealt with. Um, I have to say it is very, very complicated and difficult. And, um, and I think that, as far as I'm concerned, the United States needs to be very supportive of a two-state solution, very much for the reasons that you have stated. Uh, but ultimately, the United States cannot dictate the terms. The United States can set the table or bring them to the table, but it's the parties that, that have to make uh, the decision. I believe that the issue has to be solved for its own purposes, partially of what you have said. Um, and, um, and I have to say, when I first became um, secretary and I went to the region and I drove from Jerusalem to Ramallah and saw what was going on, I thought what has to happen is the, the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people have to be recognized. Um, and I think that that is the direction in which Secretary Kerry is leading um, the discussions. But ultimately, we have to recognize, as important as it is on its own, it is not the only problem in the Middle East. Uh, and, I, and I've always said that, everybody says, if you just solve that problem, everything else will be all right. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are other issues uh, that are going on uh, that are very complicated. And I will just state it very briefly in this way. Last winter, I was having a, a public discussion with an Arab. And I said, well, we can't call it the Arab Spring anymore because it's the winter. And so we call it the Arab Awakening. And he said, that is an outrage. The Arabs have not been asleep all this time. And I said, so what would you call it? And he said, Arab Troubles. And I said, what about Arab Opportunities? So in those four kind of thoughts, it shows what a complicated si situation is going on. Uh, and I do think that the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian issue will help, 
but it will not solve everything. And a lot of it has to do with some of the discussions from the previous panel in terms of what is it people want, how many issues are economic, how many are political, uh, are these real countries, uh, a lot of them. President Clinton uh, read a lot himself and he told us to read a lot of books. One he told me to read was called The Peace to End All Peace by an American historian, David Fromkin, that describes the creation of the modern Middle East after World War I. These are the countries that were set up. The short version of the book is the Middle East was set up as a result of the British and French bureaucracies lying to each other. So we are dealing with all of that. And so those two issues go on together. All right, thank you. Kathleen. Yeah, so I want to explore the uh, concept of partnership a little bit further you know, in relation to the first question I, I asked earlier on. Um, in your opinion, is the Obama pivot to Asia policy working effectively? Is it really trying to help um, strengthen alliances and deepen partnerships? Or is it a containment po uh, strategy towards China? And how is that constructive towards the relationship between China and the US? I think that whoever said the word pivot first probably should not be there. Uh, but because it's really a rebalancing. And I think that people need to understand the United States is not a monogamous power. We are both Atlantic and Pacific. Uh, and we can love Europe and Asia at the same time. Um, and so... This is getting personal. Yeah, that, uh, and, and I think the thing that is very clear is we have very strong relations uh, in the Pacific. Um, and we have allies in the Pacific, the Japanese and the South Koreans. Um, and we have very strong interest in the Pacific. It has not been, um, it hasn't been that simple, I think, to explain uh, not only to Americans, but also to uh, the, the countries in the Pacific. And it's been difficult to explain to the Europeans who are saying, you've left us, you've left us. And, well, and as a European myself, I go there and I say, okay, stop whining. You guys used to be the problem. You're now the solution. Help us in this. Uh, but if you, um, we were talking about the Western, in most American classrooms, there is this Western hemisphere in the middle and these two flaps on either side. Um, and when I traveled as secretary, I would always insist in classrooms that people bring me a globe to say most of the people in the world live on the other side of the globe. And it is an interest of the United States. So I think that it makes sense for the rebalancing. I do not think it's containment of China, although I think there are some Chinese who believe it uh, and some Americans who would like to see it. But I think that President Obama and his team are trying very hard to show that it's an area that is very important to us for partnership and strategic and economic cooperation. All right, thank you. Ali. Um, you will agree with me that we in Africa don't have a very long history of practicing democracy. Uh, I think there are few, if any, countries in Africa that have been living under democratic rule for more than 20 years. We still have all forms of dictatorships, but luckily we have been uh, uh, making lots of progress there. And largely due to the encouragement we have received from our Western friends, the United States being one of the uh, most prominent ones. Um, and democracy is something that you have to believe in uh, because uh, the results of using it or practicing it are not instant. You don't necessarily harvest the fruits of democracy by having an election once or even twice. Now, um, whenever we are challenged in a short history of practicing democracy, um, uh, we kind of um, struggled to, to fix these things because our institutions are still very fragile and, and, and weak. And we look to you, to the West and to the United States for leadership and, and, and advice and guidance. Now recently, when the, uh, the Egyptian government of Mohammed Morsi uh, was uh, uh, thrown out of office uh, by what we in Africa consider a coup, the African Union moved very quickly to impose sanctions. As a matter of fact, within 24 hours, uh, it imposed sanctions on that regime because it has a principle of rejecting any form of violence being used as a way of removing from office a democratically elected government. What has surprised us, however, is the deafening silence of the West about this whole issue, uh, with, and especially in the United States, and with some even suggesting 
that some kind of new form of democratic coup may have taken place uh, in Egypt. Others saying what happened in Egypt doesn't meet our definition of a coup. Um, now, we beginning to get confused in Africa. <laughs> and uh, what the hell is going on? Uh, um, should we, the next time we don't like a president in Tanzania, just go on the streets and make a lot of noise, get coverage from Al Jazeera and CNN, have that person removed, and that's the new kind of democracy we should be pursuing, and you're going to tolerate that? So I would like you to answer that. Well, um, I think that, first of all, on the first part of your question in terms of democracy, democracy is not an event. Democracy is a process, and many countries are still learning it, including our own. Uh, and we are imperfect in that ourselves. I am chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute, and we, in fact, are around the world um, helping people to understand the nuts and bolts of democracy, not imposing democracy, which is an oxymoron, uh, but in terms of just helping in a number of different ways. We could talk more about that. I think that the issue in Egypt is complicated by reality, if I could say that. Part of the, and it goes, we've had questions about what is the role of the United States? What, are the, what is the leverage the United States has? And um, I, teach a, I teach a course at Georgetown. Um, I say foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want. That's all it is. So what are the tools? And the course I teach is called the National Security Toolbox. And the truth is that there are not a lot of tools in it in terms of how you um, exert leverage, how you try to influence a country to believe to, to behave in a particular way. There's diplomacy, bilateral and multilateral. There are the economic tools, the carrots, which are aid and trade, and the sticks, which are uh, sanctions. Then there's the threat of the use of force, the use of force, intelligence, and law enforcement. That's it. There is nothing easier, if I could say that, than cutting off everything. Um, it's hard to resurrected in many different ways. And I think that um, there is a um, very complicated linguistic explanation for whatever the administration is saying. But the, the problem is the following, is if we cut off all assistance, which is what happens if you declare it a coup, we will not have any influence whatsoever. And the question is how to use that tool in a way to try to bring about some change in Egypt to make sure that the relationship between Israel and Egypt stays intact, because it goes to your point. Um, and there's something else that I think is worth understanding that is probably inside baseball, but uh, for Americans that follow the government, one of the hard parts is when Congress has a law that has, it makes the administration behave in some automatic way. And that is the law, is that if it's declared a coup, then you have to cut off all assistance. And so they're trying to figure out how to use a little bit of nuance in terms of having some influence still in Egypt. But the Egyptian situation is incredibly complicated, difficult because Morsi was elected, uh, and then also partially because the Muslim Brotherhood was, had been outlawed, gained strength in that, was the only organization that worked, and other kind of democratic uh, channels never got off the ground because of the policies there. But it's, you've asked a very tough question, and all of you have asked tough questions, to which there is no, you know, one of the things about trying to explain foreign policy is it doesn't come in very clean, perfect boxes, uh, which is why I talk about, <clears throat> you know, there are always these arguments as to whether America's foreign policy is idealistic or realistic. And I always have said that's a false dichotomy, mainly because I don't know what I am, an idealistic realist or a realistic idealist. <laughs> and so I talk about the doability doctrine. What is it that we can do? Where can we make a difference? How can the United States act in conjunction with others? What is our influence? And all of you are really asking that particular question. And Gigi, I'm going to ask you to, uh, I don't mean to uh, cut you short, but if you can uh, be quick, we're going to still try to get a couple yeah. of uh, questions she from is the going audience. To, I want to give her the spot on this one. It's about uh, women issues. You've said that uh, women issues are issues of life and death. They go from the right to have an education to rape being a, a war weapon. Um, 
and yet w there are some women and some of us we don't want to stake forward and pay and get involved and be part of the decision makers to table the issues in the agenda is there kind of a hidden agenda that really wants to keep us away of the decision makings on life and death issues um, why are we not participating what's going on well I actually do believe that there is sort of an agenda that um, there's plenty of room in the world, uh, with apologies to many people here, there's plenty of room in the world for mediocre men. There is no room for mediocre women. <laughs> and therefore, uh, 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 but I, I, I do think that there are those in some countries that do not want to see women in power. But I also think we have to take responsibility for ourselves, and that is, that there are many discussions going on about the role of women, and my sense is that women should be allowed to choose what they want to do. The word for women generally is choice. We need to have choice in the way we run our lives and in everything about it. And so, but I do think that there has been some progress. You pointed out that my youngest daughter's here. Her uh, daughter, my youngest uh, grandchild, said to her, so this was about three years ago, she said to her, so what's the big deal about Grandma Maddie being Secretary of State? <laughs> Only girls are Secretary of State. I know we're running out of time. If we can take a couple of questions from the audience, please. I know that people are, uh, have microphones. Uh, please, hello, uh, thank Let's you for, yeah, yeah, thank you for conversation. It's very inspiring. But I think that it would be incomplete if we don't bring an issue of Russia to the table, especially the President Obama bright idea was to reload the relationship with Russia. It, it, it looks like it didn't work, really. And now Russia is uh, actually exposing more and more pressure on the neighboring countries. And now this issue with Snowden. And, and actually, what, what do you think the State Department should do about it? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I used to be known as a Soviet expert. Um, I also have a library. When I look at it, I thought, well, this is more like archaeology. And then I went back and I looked at my library. There is a lot that is similar in terms of the way that uh, Russia has behaved over the years. And uh, I do think that the United States would like to have a partnership relationship with Russia. Uh, however, um, it takes two to reset. Um, and I think that part of the issue is that the Russians are going through an identity crisis of their own, having been the other superpower, and now uh, I have been part of uh, lots of surveys about Russia, uh, and I remember going there in 91, and the people in Russia were em embarrassed. They would say, we've caused so much trouble, and yet they had an identity issue, and they'd say, now we're just Bangladesh with missiles. <laughs> and so part of what has happened is this identity crisis, and what I find really, really depressing, and it goes to discussions of the Middle East, is the role that Russia is playing in what is going on in Syria. And it is not one where there is a sense that they can be partners in bringing peace and stability, but much too much involved with their own image at the time, uh, at this time. And I think that the US can try as hard as it wants to, but if uh, President Putin has different views, it is very difficult as he tries to burnish his image and that of Russia. Uh, audience member over here, please. <laughs> Is there a doability doctrine to settle the immigration problem in the United States? Um, I have to, you know, I, I am obviously very prejudiced about this. I am an immigrant um, and a very grateful immigrant. And one of the things that I enjoyed doing the most when I was a Secretary of State was going to naturalization ceremonies uh, and um, renewing my own vows and watching how many people want to come to the United States and how honored they are to become American citizens. And as I hand out their naturalization certificate, I say this is the most important piece of paper you will ever have. I have exactly the same one. Keep it safe. Uh, I think we are cutting off our nose to spite our face to uh, not have a generous, comprehensive immigration bill. I have to tell you this. I was just in Jordan. Uh, where I was there for the National Democratic Institute, I was taken to the Syrian refugee camp. And I had also, the same one that Secretary Kerry went to, 
And I also was told that there are um, Palestinian refugees and Iraqi refugees and Syrian refugees. The equivalent would be if the United States had 40 million refugees. And we're asking Jordan to deal with this. We can't even deal with 11 million undocumented workers. I do believe that the United States is an exceptional country. But we can't ask that exceptions be made for us, whether it is how to treat uh, African Americans and what happened uh, on that particular trial, what happens in terms of keeping our doors open for those who want to come and work here and participate in the American dream. We can't talk about our role if we can't figure out how to be the country of diversity and opportunity and the possibility of the pursuit of happiness. Thank you very well, much. May, Thank you very may much. I just say, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Shadia, Kathleen, Ali, Gigi, Madam Secretary, yes. Suzanne, yeah. that was just fabulous. Thank you so much. And Desmond, Indrani, Adele, Tom Pritzker, uh, Walter Isaacson, David Rubenstein, what a fabulous afternoon. Thank you so very much. We are, we're going to break now. I hope you know we have a reception with uh, lots of cold things that I know you need to imbibe right now and food down at the Door Hosier building. We'll have that open for an hour and then tonight we have yet another gathering, a great opportunity to uh, experience some great new public events. Thank you very much.